Hello and welcome to another episode of Alta Heron. I'm Rob Runacres and I'm joined by Hans Jordlin who is going to introduce our topic and our guest. Over to you Hans. Thank you. Yes, tonight we will be looking at sparring as a learning tool and more specifically some of the downsides with sparring. And we're joined tonight by Keith Farrell who will be giving his thoughts on the topic. Welcome, uh, welcome Keith, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, cool. thanks for joining us, Keith. Okay, we're going to leap straight in now. Um, well, let, let's start off by actually uh, having you perhaps describe uh, what constitutes sparring in, in, in your thoughts. Quite simply, I would say that sparring is trying to test your skills against a less cooperative opponent. And there can be quite a few different degrees of cooperation or lack of cooperation and well at the, at the top of the cooperative end you've perhaps got drilling for learning sakes and then as you become less and less cooperative um, you're, you're trying to make your skills work against someone who's trying to make his skills work and well the better the sparring from your point of view anyway the, the better you're able to make your skills work under pressure um, and overall I would say good sparring is when both combatants are being uh, quite sensible, trying to keep themselves safe and not being hit, but also able to demonstrate the system that they study so they can show off their skills effectively and also maybe, maybe even make it look good. I've heard um, uh, a lot of times um, that, that fencing is uh, a conversation, perhaps a philosophical conversation. Would you say that is what the ultimate in sparring is? I don't tend to think of it so much as a, a conversation myself because ideally I want to shut down my opponent so that he can't do anything and then I have all the options and he has none and I'd make a very, very boring conversation but from my point of view, that'd be quite good sparring in terms of me showing my skills. But do you need actually uh, some form of cooperation from your opponents in order to demonstrate those skills so you get the, the range of opportunities? Yes, and I think this is actually an interesting point that a lot of people miss. If, you're, if your partner is being uncooperative to the extent that they're not letting you win, but they are being cooperative in that they are trying to fence in a sensible fashion that fits the system they study, then that gives you a lot of opportunities to try to, to pull off the techniques from the sources. If your partner is just being purely uncooperative and they don't have any care for uh, sense or reality or system or anything like that and they're just being as awkward as they can, then the sparring is probably not going to be very good as a result. So yes, I'm not sure I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I really get what you mean there as a definition of sparring because, I mean, uh, I can shut down someone, uh, for example, uh, if, if uh, they're a beginner, for example, I can shut down someone extremely quickly and repeatedly batter them into submission and not get hit. Um, that doesn't seem particularly cooperative to me and it's me being very awkward and, and not particularly nice. Um, is, isn't there something more to sparring than that? I think this might be something we'll be talking about uh, a little bit later, but like with any uh, learning tool or exercise for practice, there can be different desired outcomes. If the intended outcome of a sparring match is for you to act as if you would in a, in a real fight and to try not to be hit but to shut down your opponent as quickly as possible, then what you just described would be excellent, that's meeting the outcome. But if the, if the point of view is just to have a, a good training session for both partners so that by the, the end of the, the sparring exercise, uh, both partners have increased in skill, then perhaps that's the wrong way to approach the exercise to achieve the, the outcome. Well, I think that, that's kind of my point, though, in that um, is, is sparring a tool for both people then or is it a, spar, uh, a tool for one, one person? I think if we're going to have you know, decent sparring, both people have got to learn from it. I would agree with you that in the, the majority of cases that's what would be best. Okay. Every so often the, the instructor might 
change up the parameters of the sparring just to to get people out of their comfort zone and trying to to work in some kind of different fashion and maybe to, to improve one of their skills or to just make it more difficult for one of the, the people so that they get more of a challenge out of it, whatever the, the instructor feels that the, the students or the, the practitioners need. Um, well, you can you can change up the parameters and see what happens. Okay, Hans, have you got any input on this? Do you feel that competition highlights this these kind of flaws that you see in sparring, or uh, because competition fencing is different from sparring, of course? But yes, it is. Uh, can you can you talk us through what you th what you think about the competition scene and if you well the flaws that you see there? Okay, there's a a few little questions in there. Uh, I'll try and address all of them. Mm -hmm. um, with different rules in competitions and with different uh, events, different groups of people, just different um, intentions and ambitions, each competition will have a slightly different feel to it, a slightly different way of going about things and also perhaps a slightly different outcome. Mm -hmm. One competition may be testing your ability to, to fight uh, 10, 20, 30 fights, so you, your stamina and your ability to keep performing well over a long period of time. Another competition uh, might be to the first hit, so you've got to pull it all out in one go and uh, apply a lot of skill very quickly without any chance to recover from a mistake. So, And of course, various degrees in between. So depending on the, again, intended outcome of a tournament or a, a com competitive sparring match as a, a learning tool, as, a, as, a le as an exercise, you'll approach it differently, you'll see different behaviours, good and bad, and it requires maybe a, a different degree of cooperation or lack of cooperation between the fighters, even in a competitive setting. Can I just throw something in there? I mean, we, we have a phrase that we do in my club in that um, when, when you're sparring, if you're not getting hit, at some point, uh, you're not sparring properly, you're not trying things. And that, that, that for me is what sparring is, is that um, it is the opportunity to trial something with your opponent and see if it works and work out why it doesn't work. It's not the acquisition of victory, um, uh, which of course competition is. And one of the things that certain competitors get told off for, of course, is conceding hits. <laughs> um, we're, we're very, we're very keen apparently to to gain the medals in, in in competition. Whereas sparring is perhaps, um, at least from my perspective, is very much two people working together to trial the techniques. But you know, good good sparring is nonetheless the opportunity to meet different opponents, hopefully, and trial out various techniques and see you know why why things work and some things don't. I would say that's my favourite approach to sparring, personally. That's what I find most useful. But then, at other times, if I want to learn other lessons or gain slightly different skills, I, I, I change up the, the sparring, what I intend to get out of it. From my point of view, sparring is just a type of exercise, and you can implement it depending on what you want to get out of it. And however you choose to set it up and implement the, the practice, you will learn different things, gain different skills. Personally, my favourite is just trying stuff with with my opponents, uh, with my training partners, seeing what I can learn, what I can improve upon without the pressure of you know, trying to win. That being said, it's far too easy to get into that uh, comfort zone of not having to win. And it's, okay, I got hit again, didn't matter, I tried something new that's not always the best frame of mind. So I try and change up how I implement my sparring exercises in my, my training sessions to make sure that I'm not getting too far into one comfort zone and I can still apply all my skills uh, depending on what the occasion calls for. Okay, so we, we've pretty much identified what we, we feel is, is generally a good spar or something like that, or some of the, the, the facets. Um, uh, to, to come to the, the, the core of what we're looking at tonight, um, what would you say, what, what are the things that irk you then about sparring? What are the things that, that um, you feel are bad? People enjoy sparring an awful lot, and that's a good thing. However, 
when they start enjoying it so much that they stop trying to fence properly and they just get into the, the swing of um, moving the sword about and trying to hit their opponent and they, they stop caring about staying safe, then it's time to, to, to stop and reset the exercise. So one of the biggest problems with, with, with sparring as a tool, uh, one of the things which irks me the most is when people stop thinking about it as trying to apply their skills um, from the system that they study and they just swing swords about and do a lot of bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very succinct Glaswegian response. <laughs> <I do. laughs> okay, do you think that, um, wh wh why are we doing this then? Is it, I mean, because some people just want to have a bash about. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's fair enough, surely. Yes. Everyone has something different that they want from the, the practice of HEMA. Some people just want to play with swords, and that's cool. Uh, it's I, not cool for you, though, is it? Well, it, it annoys me a little bit when I, I see that that's all that they're aspiring to. <laughs> you, can, you can play with swords in any setting, but if, if, if someone comes to one of my classes, then they have a certain amount of time with me, and... I like to think that I'm quite a, a good instructor and that if they pay attention to what I'm trying to teach them, they'll become a lot better. So if they then ignore what lessons I'm trying to teach and they just mess about with swords because they're enjoying swinging swords about and they're not trying to do any better, that irks me because it f makes me feel that I'm wasting my time trying to help them. If they then go home, and if they pay attention to my class and they, they try to achieve what I set them to achieve and they go home and then they just piss about in the back garden playing with swords, that's fine, that's what they want to do, that's what entertains them, cool. Uh, but when they're there at a, a lesson or an event, they really should be trying to improve their skills, otherwise what's the point? And it's not really respecting the input from the, the instructor, whoever it might be. My, my background is that of, of karate, uh, one of the, the Shoto branches of karate, so reasonably traditional. And so uh, my, my learning of martial arts to start with was very much learning a respect for the club, for the instructor, for my fellow training partners. Uh, that, that learning has persisted and I still think it's very important in historical fencing to have appropriate response for uh, appropriate respect for the club, the instructor, the training partners. So if someone's just wasting time, wasting my time, wasting his time, wasting his training partner's time, I feel that his time might be better spent, perhaps not at the class, but somewhere else. That's quite a hard response. I mean, do you not feel that it, it, it's maybe that we have a little bit of retraining to do with um, with some students, uh, perhaps because in, in of course Western mentality it's, it's to be better. We want to try and uh, achieve our you know superiority um, over <laughs> other people. And one of the ways to do that is to you know hit them thirty five times and they only hit us thirty four, which shows that we're we're better. That's a very very British answer to start to, to talk about. <laughs> Take over the whole world like the imperialist well, no, bastard you are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. It is. Tough. I mean, I, I'm very much in agreement. So it, it is very frustrating where you get people hurling themselves forwards to get that that point. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't believe the the right of way uh, in sports fencing can be blamed for everything for this. I think that there's mm. you know uh, something else going on there. No, usually it's the mentality of the individuals, their attitude towards fencing. Sometimes even just an attitude towards life. Some people are just a bit too gung-ho, possibly for their own good. Mm. Um, then, of course, we're training with lumps. Okay, but Keith, <laughs> Keith yes. well, so what is the solution? Do you have, do you have uh, like a little system when it comes to sparring that you go through to, to make people understand sparring in a, in a more serious way? I really like what you say when you talk about when people are not defending, you know, people are not caring in sparring. That, this is something I hate when I see it, and I, when mm -hmm. I see it in sparring, and when I see it in competitions, when both me and Rob judge a lot of competitions, you do as well. So when you see people go up in competition and just swing swords against each other, and they don't care about 
defending or anything. They're just gonna go give that hit and then they take a hit at the same time. That's it, mm. it, it's annoying. But so, but do you have like uh, a system or something to solve the problem? I have a, a somewhat informal system that does tend to to solve the problem mm. uh, within my clubs. And to put it very, very bluntly, um, I find brainwashing my students into good behaviour is a very effective method. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> yes, go on. <laughs> so, um, for, for whenever I'm doing demonstrations, I perform uh, at my very best and mm -hmm. I try to, to showcase what it is I want my students to aspire towards. When I'm having my, my students drill, uh, doing whatever technique or sequence in the air or against a partner again and again and again, I'm making sure that they understand what it is they're trying to achieve, not just in the, the physical term of I want to hit him in the head, but also in terms of I'm waiting my time, take, w waiting for the opening to present itself. I then hit him in the head and escape and cover and make sure I don't get hit in the way out. I have certain phrases um, that I, I use again and again and again. Things like uh, get in cleanly, hit cleanly, get out cleanly. Mm. And if I keep repeating these, then inevitably my students start to remember them and even my, my, my co-instructors and my advanced students, when they go on and they, they start coaching or teaching other people, uh, they start to repeat these same sayings as well. So it's a very, very friendly and gentle form of brainwashing that gets what I believe to be good sayings, good attitudes, good behaviours okay. uh, into, into people's minds and practices. Can you just bring this back, maybe trying to stoke up a little bit of a controversy here, but um, how endemic would you say poor sparring is in HEMA. I'm not obviously suggesting that let's point fingers, but how bad or how wide is, is this? Very. Um, quite simply, most beginners cannot spar well because they don't know enough techniques. They, they can't keep themselves safe properly. They don't know enough of the system to showcase their system. Beginners cannot spar very well until they are taught how to. Therefore, I would say that bad sparring is very widespread. Wherever there are beginners, there's bad sparring. And then, unfortunately, some people don't learn how to do it properly. And four, five, twelve years mm -hmm. later, they're still sparring badly. Uh, part of that is sometimes because they think they're doing well and they're not willing to accept any criticism to the contrary. Sometimes it's because they just don't have a good instructor who can uh, bring good practice out of them. Sometimes perhaps it's because they are in fact the best at sparring in their club, but they never go and practice with any other clubs. They don't realize that what they're doing isn't good enough. It's good enough in their own small little environment, but it's not good enough anywhere else. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, places which, uh, cl clubs or, or schools which follow a very isolationist policy, tend to have a lot more bad sparring than clubs which get out there into the world, meet with other clubs and cross train an awful lot more. Do you think this is actually common, um, certainly within the UK, do you think this is a common occurrence? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, at least up here in Scotland, there's not a lot of cross training between clubs. There's the, the odd one or two individuals who, who go and make the the long trek from Glasgow to Edinburgh or the other way around or from Dundee to one of the other cities or the other way around or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's because the, the clubs just don't share any common interests. I wouldn't expect there to be a, a huge amount of um, overlap between, for example, the, the small sword clubs in Edinburgh and the, the long sword clubs in Glasgow and Dundee. But where there are clubs that do the same disciplines, mm. It would be nice if there was a bit more cross-training, and that's even just within Scotland. Uh, when we add the rest of the UK into the equation, unfortunately the, the borders tend to be 
quite physical <laughs> and not a lot of people cross the borders from Scotland to England or the other way around um, over to, to Ireland. I'd say that the Irish are actually pretty good at coming to, the, to, to, to Scotland or England. Unfortunately, not so many of us are good at crossing the water that way. Yeah, that's true. Um, having said that, how do you feel about your students going away to sparring sessions at other clubs where you are unable to see them? It's a good experience for them. Because In every instance, really? I'd say or almost you, every instance. Or do you feel that you have to brainwash them again when they come home? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Sometimes the, the experience of going somewhere else and sparring in a different environment unfortunately brings out bad behaviours or worse behaviours. However, I would say that in the majority of circumstances, going outside their comfort zone, meeting with different people, uh, sparring with, you know, against different styles or, or ways of doing things, really opens their eyes and gives them the the opportunity to up their game rather than, than lowering it. Okay. Hans, um, Sweden is, is renowned for clubs working together. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, because we like each other. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, obvious point. <laughs> not, no, but, uh, well, we have a good, good ground, foundation of people who really... Uh, work well together, very closely together, and we, we're we not very hierarchic at all as a, as a people. We're kind of flat organized all the time. Uh, so the clubs work well together, yes, it's very easy. And uh, we have sparring seminars, sparring workshops every year in Sweden, uh, of course organized by, of course, <laughs> quality by Mm. As, as, as usual, but uh, he started to have. Um, he has invited people to come, come to, come to this place, and we spar a whole week and have fun together, and it works out so, so well. So now, every, I mean, we get people from England and other countries to, to come to this sparring event when we just spar and hang out for a week, and it, it's really, it really like fun. Re rewarding. It really is fun and it's rewarding. You get to see people, you get to try out different things, you get to see different styles. It's uh, it's amazing. It's one of the best uh, events in, in Sweden you can go to actually. So, yeah. Uh, but, but, but it comes from the fact that we work really well together in Sweden. All the Swedish clubs are really, are really close and we have instructors meetings uh, once or twice a year when we are just get together and we do something. The last time we did was we, we were doing test cutting with Peter Johnson uh, for, a, for, for a day and just hung out together, you know. It was, it's, um, that, that way we kind of, we, we, we build a very strong, uh, strong base to, to stand on for, for, for the Swedish clubs, so. Okay, so perhaps um, some of the spying issues we're talking about then, we, we're saying there's, um, is there some cultural things or, or some mentalities, particularly in the UK, on approach? And there's also some of the, the, the lack of cooperation. What about equipment? Do we feel that um, certain equipment leads to poor sparring techniques? Yes and no. The same piece of equipment used by two different people can produce both results. One person, if they have the right mentality and approach to the, the sparring match, will work around any problems and use it to create good fencing. The other person, if, it has, if he or she has the wrong mentality, will take the same bit of equipment and will no doubt find all the problems with it. Yeah, For example, yeah, um, a good pair of gloves. Let's say the sparring gloves. Uh, I've come across some people who, upon putting on their sparring gloves, realised that their hands didn't feel much pain anymore. And so they abandoned good mechanics and didn't really care mm. about getting hit in the hands quite so much. And their sparring went downhill as a result of having good equipment. 
Uh, on the other hand, haha, pun. Uh, so I've seen some people get the sparring gloves, and because they are no longer afraid of getting their hands broken, they're more interested in trying out things that previously they would not have risked. And as a result, because they put themselves out there, they, they quite literally put their hands out there in front, uh, they learn how to do things better and they, 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 their sparring goes upwards in terms of skill. And both of these cases spar from the, the same, uh, not spar, they uh, stem from the same uh, issue with the, the gloves, that of feeling less pain. One person takes that in a negative direction, another person takes that in a positive direction. Okay, do you think that's the same thing that's happening with um, uh, some of the mentalities around synthetics as well? Um, obviously, the synthetics are very useful in that they're a cheap alternative uh, for most people on an entry level. Um, but of course, other people think, well, I can't be hurt or I cannot hurt anyone with a synthetic, and then proceed to batter the living daylights out of people who, who are not in heavy kit. I don't think synthetics are necessarily any safer than steel swords. Mm -hmm. I think anything which is designed as a sword has the potential to do a lot of damage, to inflict a lot of pain on a training partner, and therefore it is incumbent upon the individuals involved to spar or train at a low intensity, a middle intensity, a high intensity, and to wear the necessary safety equipment to facilitate the intensity at which they are training. So if they're sparring gently in a very friendly fashion, just seeing if they can um, land a certain technique or if they can apply some, some certain footwork or whatever, but it's all light contact and friendly, then sure, masking gloves is fine. But if you want to, to, to move the sword as fast as you can and hit each other like you're trying to cleave each other, then a sword simply being synthetic is no guarantee of safety. You should pad up as you would for any intensive or high intensity sparring, be it with steel, wood, plastic, you know, whatever. How do we as instructors, uh, or even people who are, who are new, new to Hannah, how, how, how do they, how do we facilitate good sparring? What are the steps? When I have newcomers in my club, I don't always dive straight into full speed sparring. Often I will start with slow motion sparring to get people accustomed to working against an uncooperative opponent um, without the stress and pressure that comes of high intensity work. Also because they don't have all the safety gear or even if they borrow quite a quite a lot of safety gear from other people or from the club. They don't necessarily uh, know how to move correctly in it. So one approach is to start off slowly and gradually build the speed over the course, um, maybe two, three, four months or whatever. I, I don't think time limits or time requirements are particularly useful in martial arts. I, I'm not one of the people who will who, say, uh, you've got to do six months of training before you can even dream of sparring. But I wouldn't throw people into full speed, full contact sparring on day one. Just like we uh, teach and coach people to, to do a technique better in drilling and then teach them a new technique and coach them to do it better and so on like that, and we gradually build up our students' knowledge and skills, we've got to do the same as w with sparring. We've got to try and bridge the gap between simply drilling and going all out in sparring. We've got to have intermediate steps and exercises. And we've just got to make sure that we have a, a reasonable expectation of what our students can achieve and we give them the right exercises to, to achieve the outcomes which are necessary for their development. Okay, well, before we round off then, Keith, uh, you've got a, a major event coming up in Glasgow. Do you want to just say a few words of, um, about that? Yes. The first weekend of March is HEMAC Glasgow, and it's going to be a longsword event. We're just going to be doing purely longsword, and the theme is one that is quite dear to my heart. It is about style. 
So the, uh, according to the, the event website, the theme of the event will be comparing the key stylistic elements of different longsword systems. Instructors will present lessons showcasing the key stylistic elements of the longsword system that they train. And at the end of the event, we will have a roundtable discussion to compare and contrast the different styles taught over the weekend. And who have you got speaking? We have a range of instructors. Um, we have some, some instructors from within our, our own organisation, the Academy of Historical Arts, such as Alex Burdas, uh, Mark Wilkie, Tim Gallagher. Um, we've also got Dr. Daria Izdebska giving a presentation on the role of linguistics in the study of HEMA when it comes to looking at the sources, preparing translations, working with translations, all of this sort of thing. The language, possibly even the style of language, it can have a, a, major, uh, a major role in how we then go and understand the systems we're studying. From out with the Academy of Historical Arts, we have William Bouillet coming from France. We have Stevie Thurston uh, coming up from England to, to do some English longsword. Um, the idea is you can go to a, a big event and do an introduction to Fiore class, uh, a Lichner's Five Strikes class, you, you can do a, I don't know, a, a Wrestling at the Sword class, and while it'll all be interesting, it's not going to be very coherent as a, an overall learning experience. Here, because the instructors will be presenting the stylistic elements of their system, it means that while afterwards you might not remember any one particular action very well, you will have a good opportunity, uh, a good memory and feeling that this system kind of feels like this, it focuses on these elements, whereas this system over here has similar actions and techniques, but has a completely different focus as a system. Mm. Okay, but, could you just give the website's address uh, for people to... Um, yes. This yes, it is www.academyofhistoricalarts.co.uk events, hemac-glasgow. Or if you just put hemac-glasgow into Google, it will come up. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Right, yeah, Keith, really. thank you very much for spending your time with us and uh, for discussing this Yeah, You're hey, welcome. Thank uh, you for posing these questions. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on the issue, but uh, a couple of your questions made me think about how I conceptualise some of these issues, so that was useful. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, cheers then, Keith. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.